Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, one of whom was calling it a scumball activity, the other saying, Bill Gates saying he would short this thing if he could. And you're saying they're all wrong. Yeah. What is Bitcoin and why was it created in the first place? These two are the main questions I'm going to try explaining in this video. So to understand what Bitcoin is, we first need to understand what money is and its evolution over the past years. Money is basically a belief system. If you actually think about it, money is something which you or the majority of the people believe has value. We've used things like cattle, papers, coins, shells, etc. as money in the past. According to economics, the properties of money include for it to be a medium of exchange, unit of account and store of value. Fiat, which is the money that we're using right now, definitely fulfills the first two properties, but does not prove to be a good store of value. A store of value is basically a place where people put their money in with an assumption for it to grow in the future, or at least not depreciate in value. Fiat does not prove to be a good store of value because of its inflationary nature, which means it's continuously devaluing. INR's value has dropped 75 times against the dollar, which itself has dropped by 96% since the Fed was first created. In the history of money, we first started off with barter system, which included exchange of goods and services. Then we shifted to commodity money. And there we also started using gold as a medium of exchange or money. Now, using gold as money had a lot of disadvantages. First, that it was extremely difficult to carry. And second, it wasn't easily divisible. So if you actually wanted to get a dozen of bananas or some random fruit, you couldn't just go and cut your gold in a way and then give it as money. It's not feasible in the long term. After that, we went on the gold standard, which meant the government started creating paper or currency notes, which were then backed or pegged by gold and hence were interchangeable by gold, which also means that they could only print the currency notes in accordance to the gold that they already had in the reserves. But after 1976, we completely abandoned the gold standard and the US dollar became pure fiat. Fiat means by decree or by order of the government, which means we believe it has value because the government has promised for it to have value and because it's backed by the strongest military of the greatest economy of the world. Currently, we've been following our traditional legacy finance system, which relies on fiat, US dollar, INR, etc. This is inflationary in nature and the government has entire control over it and can print as much money as they want. This is only because after the 1970s, the US dollar or fiat was not backed by gold anymore. Now, what are the major drawbacks of fiat? Fiat basically has two major drawbacks. First, that it's completely centralized. And second, it's unlimited supply. So fiat is completely centralized, which means that we're placing our trust in a third party or an intermediary. For example, we trust the government for what we consider to be money. And the government has actually failed a lot of times in the same. In 2016, the Indian government literally took the legal status of the currency money being used by banning 501,000 rupee notes, which just proved how we don't actually have any authority or control over our own money. Then we also trust the banks in keeping our money safe. They actually have the entire liberty to use our money and to invest it and to give out us loans without us having any knowledge about it. There have been multiple instances where the banks have actually failed to pay people their own money. Like in case of PMC, they created a huge mess all over the country as they loaned out most of the depositors' money to a single company named HDIL that defaulted in paying the loan back because of which even today a lot of people haven't received their own money. Another huge drawback of fiat is its unlimited supply. This is because the government can print as much money as they want. Last year, trillions of dollars were printed by the Federal Reserve. Such printing of money is something that causes hyperinflation, which in simpler terms means an immense rise in price. When you see the prices rising over time, more than that, it's actually the purchasing power of your own money depreciating in value. You need more INR or more USD for something which used to cost less. After this, we transitioned easily into digital money. The main problem with that was that of double spending. Double spending is a potential flaw in a digital cash scheme in which the same single digital token can be spent more than once. Unlike physical cash, a digital token consists of a digital file that can be duplicated or falsified easily. This problem with the existing financial system is solved by having intermediaries or third parties whom we trust. Wire transfers, Paytm, PayPal, UPI, etc. are just various forms of digital money that we know now. This again is just giving all the control and authority to third parties. 
Creating an alternative to such a monetary system which has been going on since thousands of years seemed impossible until 2008 when Satoshi Nakamoto released the Bitcoin white paper which suggested an alternate financial system, the Bitcoin standard. This claimed to solve the problem of double spending without any third parties, without anybody to trust or without anybody to give the control to. Bitcoin uses peer-to-peer -peer technology to operate with no central authority or banks. Managing transactions and the issuing of Bitcoin is carried out collectively by the network. Bitcoin is open source, its design is public, nobody owns or controls it and everybody can take a part in it. Now how does Bitcoin solve all the problems we've talked about? Let's compare Bitcoin to the banks. Bank actually manages a ledger of transactions and balances, which is actually not transparent or for the public eye. You can't just go to the bank and ask them to share those details with you. On the other hand, Bitcoin is a transparent public ledger without anybody having any control over it. This means that anyone can actually take a look at all transactions from when Bitcoin was first operational in 2009 on its public ledger, which is actually called the blockchain. All the transactions are transparent and public. However, the identity of the people involved in the transaction is not revealed, which makes Bitcoin pseudo-anonymous. It also solves the two major problems caused by fiat that we discussed earlier, centralization of control and unlimited supply. Bitcoin has a hard cap of 21 million Bitcoin, which means it's programmed in a way that there can never be more than that. This also means that the core unit of account is going to increase in value and appreciate in value over the years just because of the basic rule of demand and supply. The beauty of Bitcoin is that it actually gains value over time, making it deflationary in nature. On the other hand, fiat is actually inflationary in nature. It actually devalues over time. This makes Bitcoin a far better store of value than fiat ever was. With Bitcoin, you are the one who's in control of your own money. There are no banks, no government, no central authority, nobody, no authority to trust in short. Now we must think that it's almost impossible to run these many computers on a single network without having any authority or anybody looking over those. But if that happens, it will actually defeat the purpose of decentralization, which is one of the most basic properties of Bitcoin. This is actually solved by something called Bitcoin mining. Bitcoin mining is the way transactions are confirmed by the network without any involvement of any third party. Mining is performed using sophisticated hardware wherein miners are required to solve an extremely complex puzzle or mathematical equation and the one which solves it the quickest gets rewarded in Bitcoin which is basically a reward given to the miners for helping or facilitating or participating in the network. This is also how new Bitcoin get issued in the network along with verifying and validating the transactions. This was a brief explanation of what Bitcoin is and why was it created or invented in the first place. India was actually ranked second in a list of 20 countries with the highest cryptocurrency adoption rate according to a crypto analysis platform called Chain Analysis. This is obviously great for the scope of cryptocurrencies in India. Currently, a lot of major companies have invested in Bitcoin, including Tesla, MicroStrategy, Square, Coinbase, and a lot of people, including Elon Musk, Snoop Dogg, Kanye West, and even Amitabh Bachchan, who, by the way, is now the brand ambassador of CoinDCX, one of the leading crypto exchanges in India. Bitcoin's adoption rate all over the world and its awareness has been growing massively over these past years. And if the momentum keeps on growing like this, which I believe it will, the change Bitcoin will have on our lives will be beyond what we can even begin to imagine. When it comes to investing, you should definitely do your own research, but if not all, a certain amount or a small percentage of your portfolio should definitely be in cryptocurrencies, mainly Bitcoin, or you'll actually be missing out on one of the greatest transfers of wealth the human history has ever experienced. Crypto asset. Well, Bitcoin is the best crypto asset. Okay. What's the second best? There is no second best. There's no second best crypto asset. There's a crypto asset. It's called Bitcoin, right?